Welcome to the next episode of the Post North podcast. So, so this episode will begin a bit differently because uh, it's almost a week left until the next Foss North event. And this year it'll be uh, virtual again. But I'd still like to show you the fossnorth.se slash 2021 site uh, because I'm really exciting, excited about all the, uh, the speakers that we have. Um, we have everything from public money, public code into how to port languages to risk five, how to, uh, how to use open source in project management and marketing to, to writing your own custom device drivers. It's, it's high and low, uh, and everything seems very interesting to me. Um, while on the topic, I'd also like to spend some time thanking all our sponsors. Uh, they've been very patient and helpful during the pandemic. Um, so our gold sponsors, Looksoft and Red Hat Ansible, also our silver sponsors, ITRS Group, Make It Right, Ambition, as well as all of our base sponsors and our partners. And speaking of partners, we have a number of community partners and we will have a community day this year again. So, so we had a great one 2019, uh, which was a physical event where we had a number of satellite events throughout the city. Um, last year we had to cancel on short term due to the pandemic, but this year we're going again. Uh, so we have workshops around uh, machine learning, text interpretation, GNOME, Rust, you name it. There's also a big workshop on public money, public code, uh, based around uh, an organization called NOSAT. Uh, that's a part of the Swedish public sector or an organization around the Swedish public sector, I'd say. Um, on the Wednesday, so June 2nd. So please join us for lots and lots of fun. Community event from May 30th to June 2nd and the main conference with uh, lots and lots of online talks uh, on uh, May 31st and June 1st. Um, entrance is free. Uh, there will be YouTube streaming. Uh, the links will be available on the page, but do drop by, check out the schedule and, uh, and enjoy. And now back to the original program. Welcome to the next episode of the Post North podcast. Uh, today we have a visitor from Debricht, uh, Emil. Uh, Emil, please introduce yourself. You are. Uh, I must interrupt. Is this the next episode? Isn't this the current? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> depends. Depends. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Emil. Well, it depends on the perspective of the listener, I guess. Uh, yeah. But uh, thanks for having me. My name is Emil, and uh, I'm one of the co-founders and head of data science at Debricked. Um, and we're a Swedish startup working with uh, everything regarding open source. So building a software as a service tool where we do open source management. Um, and uh, I, we also do compliance, like, like you guys uh, like to talk a lot about. And yeah, but, it's, a, it's a small world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a small world with a with a lot of open source. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I, I'm, uh, a short... I'm a bit curious. You say uh, everything uh, with open source. But can you explain? Well, everything maybe it was a bit too broad there. <laughs> but uh, what we do is that we. Uh, we have an umbrella term that we call open source management, where we look at the open source company's use and uh, dragging into their proprietary software. Uh, so, and we have three perspectives currently uh, where we do open source management in terms of compliance and licensing, vulnerability and security, and the quality of the open source projects that you're using uh, which we have product, uh, productified in terms of open source health, uh, which uh, derives different quality metrics on the open source that, that you're using. So things like uh, product activity and, and bug reports and stuff like that, then I guess. Yeah, exactly. So that's actually, it was a quite fun project to start with because uh, we actually cloned GitHub, uh, like the full complete thing, uh, which is uh, quite cool. Uh, and then we uh, uh, actually patented a model in terms of how you can derive open source metrics in a scalable manner. So looking at 
looking at that perspective, there are a couple of different products out there, namely uh, uh, the Chaos Project, for example. Yeah. Have you heard of Have you heard of them? Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, they're actually speaking during the no sad day of, of the Foss North uh, event. Uh, oh. a, a Red Hat representative involved in the project. Ah, really? Cool. Yeah, I really like uh, the Chaos Project. Uh, we're they're friends of mine, and, uh, and but they come from more from the community management perspective, where you as an open source manager want to un really understand the underlying community of your open source project was we derive metrics on all the hundreds or thousands of open source projects that you're using as an open source consumer. Um, so and th that's uh, a bit different, and especially in terms of like how, how you do it in terms of scalability. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a fun project to work with all that data. How, how many projects have you, or are you monitoring? I mean, it's... Uh... There's a large uh, setup. Yeah, so like we have we have uh, uh, we have all the data from most large package managers such as uh, pip, Maven, Gradle, npm, etc. Uh, and uh, from GitHub, we're monitoring. There is about forty-ish million projects on GitHub, uh, but we're currently only monitoring the seven most relevant, uh, seven million most relevant projects. Uh, we currently define that as all projects that have uh, pull requests and releases. Cool. All right, interesting. That's a good database. I, I'm, uh, I'm curious here. You, you you already touched upon it by by saying what like what you consider important. But if you look at the health of a an open source project, uh, you've mentioned metrics. I think so. What kind of metrics? Number yeah. two. Blah blah blah. Yeah. So currently, we derive uh, like an aggregate uh, latent metric for contributors uh, mm -hmm. and the quality of contributors, as well as the popularity. Um, and these are actually derived from uh, a multitude of different um, underlying features. Uh, so, for instance, on the contributor part, we are looking at uh, the trend of contributors, the diversity of the of the contribu contributors, the experience of the contributors if they are contributing to different projects than the one you're monitoring, for instance. Um, so, if if I go into a little bit more depth, we have a hierarchical hierarchical structure in three layers, where we have metrics, which is the uh, which is the big number, so to say, the contributor score and the popularity score. And, and those are derived from practices. And practices are typically things that you ask of an open source project, such as, is the community active? Are the contributors still active? Are the core team uh, contributors still committed to the project? Um, and those practices are derived from features, which is raw queries usually, or some are a bit more involved but such as the number of stars, the number of downloads, the total number of commits, and so on. I have to ask when you say this, because I, I often see the stars being used as a metric. Is there any correlation between stars and project activity, so to speak? It, it always seems like a Facebook like to me. It's a, it, does it have anything to do with the technical quality? Well, I mean, that's... I, I guess that's one of the beautiful things about open source that uh, that if something is good and useful, stars tend to come. Uh, so there's definitely like correlation between between overall quality and stars, I think. Uh, but then again, you have to put that into the context of what the open source project is doing. Um, for instance, like Kubernetes and TensorFlow and things like that have a lot of stars because those are those are things that get stars because a lot of people, for one, use them and they're high profile open source projects. And while other projects that are not as, uh, there's, they can still be really, really good, but they don't solve as a broad problem or as a high profile problem. For instance, uh, one of my favorite projects is, uh, is it, it's called RESTEX, Flask RESTEX. It's, uh, it automatically generates documentation for your APIs. 
Uh, it doesn't have that many stars, but uh, it's uh, great. Cool. But when it comes to this huge database, and then we, we started off touching on compliance, do, do you use a similar database on the compliance side? Or how? Uh, maybe we should give some, some background to the term uh, for, for new listers, listeners also. So I mean, the, the trick is to make sure that the code is properly licensed. And, and that you follow the licenses when you when you link and use stuff and so on. So, so you need some sort of database about the project or, or information about what licenses they involve. Um, is it the same volume of projects in there, or what's your approach around that? Yeah, so that's uh, actually like the same underlying data lake, but uh, but it's a quite different problem. While like looking at open source metrics, you're looking at usually repositories and package managing package manager data. While on licensing, it's it's even though the a lot of uh, license stuff is kind of uh, is kind of mature in terms of like the SPDX standard and so on, which is nice. Uh, but how you set and let you let the world know that I'm using this license can vary quite a lot. Um, for instance, GitHub projects, you can set the license in the actual project uh, uh, as a GitHub metadata kind of feature. You can have license files. You can set the license in the, in the package manager as well. And there are lots of places where you can set the license um, and in different ways. And that's, I guess, our problem where we can have multiple sources of, li of licenses for a project uh, and try to determine which one is correct, or if there are multiple correct ones, or if they're conflicting, and so on. Uh, it's quite an interesting problem, actually, uh, determining uh, the license of an open source project. And I suppose, I suppose, in the in the sort of extension of that to to determine once you have the license of a project, then you need to sort of determine the same for its its dependency project. Which, you know, I mean, I mean, it's it's usually that the maintainers know what they're doing, but it's it's not always the case that the license match what you, what sort of, that the licenses of your dependencies match the license of what you're doing. Uh, and it, it might be, you know, different cases where if you use it like this, then this license applies, but otherwise, um, I, I've always uh, thought that that is like the, the hardest problem in, in compliance to sort of, um, match it up once once you know what the licenses there are then how to sort of match them up through the stack sort of yeah definitely how, how do you deal or do you even deal with uh, that type of configuration dependencies I, I know for instance that that Qt has dependencies that pushes it into GPL v3 territory if you configure it in certain ways rather than being GPL v2. Uh, but from the license header of Qt itself, you only see v2 or v3. Uh, and the, the which one you end up with is sort of implied by, by how you do the configuration. Uh, yeah, and I guess that, that's like a real, that's a tough challenge within licensing because, I mean, it, it's one thing to say that, OK, I bring in Qt or some, some other dependency. And depending on how I use it, different licenses apply. Um, and it's hard to actually, like, if I have, for, I may have the dependency in my code base, and that's clear, but what licenses I'm actually using during runtime and what code is executed and what what code, what license affects me can be hard, quite hard to derive. And like the honest answer for us now is that we don't, uh, we don't derive the license from a run, from a running environment, but we do it statically uh, from the, uh, from the code. Uh, As is you, you focus on the source code basis of things. Yeah. Do, do you also do like uh, how should I put it? Uh, like snippet analysis and these things. That, that I know that other uh, Black Duck used to to promote that, for instance, that they ensure that there are no traces of code with another license within the files. Or do yeah, you so the metadata. Uh, of course, like depending on the use case here, like. Looking at what we do at the Bricked, uh, we are more of like holistic kind of open source management 
type of tool. Um, and looking at what our customers ask for snippet analysis is not really one of them currently. Uh, but we do have support for it through, uh, through uh, some friends of ours, uh, Scan OSS, which is uh, yeah. we use a separate vendor then. You probably know about them. And, um, um, but, uh, uh, but we do do kind of snippet analysis uh, within uh, vulnerabilities, where we look at if you're using the vulnerable parts uh, of, uh, of the open source project. Uh, so if you have a CVE, you can tell if the CVE applies or sort of, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So for instance, uh, our open source projects typically, like depending on how large it is, do a multitude of things. So uh, for instance, there is this project in Java called Netty, uh, which has a decompression compression part and a web server part. Um, and there are different vulnerabilities for the web server part and different vulnerabilities for the compression part. Um, and we can derive through uh, static analysis whether which part of Netty you're using and if you are affected by uh, the web server vulnerabilities or the compression vulnerabilities. Um, cool. Oh, yeah, that is really nice. I, I had to sit like it took me a week or something to go through a list of CVEs for the Linux kernel. Uh, that was generated by a, a tool to just check the version I was using. But you know, most of these CVs were for subsystems that we didn't ever have configured to use. So, no. Yeah. But I'm just curious here. Why do you combine a web server and a decompression? Uh, that's Netty, and I'm not sure. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not, I haven't actually used Netty. It was just a really, really good case to uh, to de to to demo it. Uh, but there are like you just don't get it fast. <laughs> but when it comes to CVs, are those generally mapped to uh, to symbol names or something that you can use, or is that something that you have to do manually to to sort of say that this this CV affects any code that touches this, so that you can then do your your analysis of the of the client? And my answer to that is no, and uh, no. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, it's not publicly available in any database uh, because it's quite a difficult thing to to derive. And no, we don't do it manu manually. We do it uh, automatically. Um, so, like looking looking at the CVs, uh, if you manage to link CVs to the, the uh, to uh, the repository that it affects. Uh, so, if you for the Netty example, we find the Netty repository. Um, uh, well, uh, one simple way is to just check out the uh, the last vulnerable version and then the first non-vulnerable version, and then you can diff those uh, different uh, different code bases and find out which vulnerable symbols uh, which symbols are actually vulnerable, which is one solution. Um, and but that can be good, uh, but the problem there is that you typically, in a release, you don't only fix a vulnerability, uh, you fix a lot of things, and that means that uh, you get a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of more symbols that aren't actually part of that vulnerability, but uh, those are still changed with, uh, within that, uh, between those two versions. Uh, so what we do is that we, we actually do quite a lot of machine learning under the hood, uh, so there we have uh, uh, quite good algorithms predicting on both uh, the, uh, the the commit messages and the uh, the code and the code diffs as well as pull request issues and so on to build a kind of prediction on that graph and f and try to narrow it down to fewer symbols. Um, so typically we find only one or two commits that potentially fixes that vulnerability and that narrows down the amount of symbols quite vastly. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you do major releases and stuff like that, you would you get a lot of false positives. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But what's the typical use case for for your tooling? Is it is it to sort of ensure that you're compliant when you're when you're releasing your software as a proprietary software vendor, or can it be implied? Um, Applied even to to sort of a pure open source project, and just make sure that it is compliant to to its peers. Yeah, definitely. Like both of those, I say, are definitely valid use cases. Uh, if you look at our customers, it's typically uh, like kind of modern, 
kind of modern uh, software stacks with uh, other software as a service companies where you uh, where you want to uh, make sure that you are uh, comply with uh, with all your licenses and don't bring in open source projects with uh, with licenses that bear risk to your to your business or your code base um, and as well as looking at both the other use cases in terms of um, monitoring your security and security vulnerabilities and looking at uh, open source health uh, from a tech debt perspective usually. Um, so for instance, making sure that you choose the right components to start with. Um, and, uh, and I'm probably guessing that we're all familiar with uh, making, uh, making the wrong decision and uh, needing to change the open source project later on for a huge cost in time. <laughs> Everyone apart from Henrik. <laughs> Everyone apart from Henrik. Yeah. But it's, it's kind of interesting that you do this in the SaaS space, because I, I think our background is embedded, uh, where we're sort of the a lot of the licensing is triggered by you shipping the product to a consumer. Um, yeah. what, what would you say are the typical risks in, in the SaaS space? So there are some licenses that can have implications. For instance, uh, AGPL uh, can have some implications. Uh, it's not a very common license today, um, but uh, but it can have. A, but it but, but it's very it's not very permissive. Um, uh, but then again, we do support like different use cases. So in our tool, you can set uh, set up for each repository uh, for each of your repositories that. Uh, how you're using it if you're for instance you're deploying it and uh, on on hardware and distributing the hardware or are you distributing the code as code you sell or are you using it as a cloud service then as a as a software as a service then you have very different license implications and we arrange the licenses in terms of risk to your uh, to your business and you can manage that and look at what 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 software projects that you have brought in have uh, have high risk and what is that, what is lower risk? I would like to go back because I, I think you you one took this in the wrong direction a bit too early. So <laughs> I want to go back. Sorry. Uh, I'm super curious. So you mentioned the quality of the contributor earlier on. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, uh, and you said um, one like metrics was uh, if uh, the user or co uh, contributor is active in uh, different uh, projects or yep. repositories, what kind of activity are you looking at? So like when we, when we did our large scale analysis of what is good to measure, we mm -hmm. saw that typically open source projects uh, that have higher popularity and higher usage have uh, a diverse set of contributors and contributors that are not uh, and contributors that have some experience within the open source community as well uh, tend to uh, tend to be more popular and tend to uh, when we look at the, the the open source projects manually uh, in our subject view be have a higher contributor quality um, so then we look at those contributors within uh, our GitHub clone and look at uh, if they have pull requests merged in other projects and the popularity of those projects. Um, and then we, of course, we filter out their own projects so they so they don't it doesn't count if they get pull requests in their own project. Um, and looking at how much they support other communities with uh, comments, issues, and so on. Um, so like under and it's like it's not like we we don't want to say that okay we know what a good contributor score is and this is the finite truth and nothing else, everything else is wrong uh well, the only thing i want to do there is to enable to enable the the calculation of a contributor score that the community can have consensus of is somewhat sensible um, so, like this is quite still in development and uh, in the scalability phase. So we look. So we haven't finalized uh, some restrictions within the model to keep it scalable. Uh, but this will be released open source, and the model itself and what actually uh, what the contributor scores consist of. Uh, 
I'm, I want to let the community around the open source health model decide exactly what that is. Uh, I'm asking because uh, I, when I used to work at the University of Gothenburg, we had a, a thesis where we set out, this is like 10, 10, 15 years ago, 10 at least, um, we set out to measure and it was really hard to find what is like activity, what is quality of a, so, so I'm, I'm not trying to hold you up against the wall. I'm, I'm super curious because it, it is interesting. And I noticed by accident, I added and removed a couple of things due to my extensive stupidity qualities. Uh, some things at GitHub, and I got, got a lot of like uh, more green color for for doing a mistake. So mm -hmm. the, the it, it's interesting, but let's leave that. Uh, that was just to like make you not feel bad about me asking. So I'm also curious about you mentioned that you're measuring at GitHub. Are you measuring? That mean it would mean that you're missing GNOME, KDE, and Apache, and most of the GNU projects. Yes. So are, are you looking at other repo sites as well? Uh, no, we're not. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, definitely we're going to. Um, cool. But uh, but one part of my analysis here, um, and this is, of course, uh, a lot of assumptions here, but projects tend to move out of GitHub or not move to GitHub if they, have, uh, if they are very mature, very large, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, heavily supported, um, and then my uh, and then my conclusion is that it's not as interesting to look at those projects in terms of like uh, uh, in your app stack straight away. Uh, so uh, that's why we that's why we're not doing that right now. So that they are they are probably good enough already then. Yeah, that's my assumption. That uh, that large projects that li don't live on GitHub are probably quite good uh, if they can support the infrastructure and, and the community building and so on outside of GitHub. Then they're probably quite fine. GitHub is a new source for <laughs> yeah. you. are probably too young to know that. <laughs> nah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but uh, uh, okay. but one thing that uh, that's quite interesting is that when we did our, our subjective review, like um, we first, of course, we, we looked at research and uh, our opinion and did interviews of what an open source model should consist of. And then, uh, and then we built it and then we tried to measure it uh, in, and see what how well correlates, uh, does it correlate with the subjective opinions of developers just being told, give this project a contributor score. And you decide how you do it. You can you have an hour, and the highest correlation feature uh, we got was uh, something we call contributor influence, uh, where we look at uh, the amount of followers a contributor has times the amount of pull requests it does in a repository. Uh, so, like high, highly influential contributors uh, that are contributing to a repository, if you have a lot of those it correlates well with the subjective view of developers that uh, gives uh, a like subjective contributor score to a project, which was interesting. Yeah. yeah. Do you publish any blogs or anything about these findings? I, I guess there's a lot of fun things to, to sort of correlate and, and realize that there is correlation, but also that there is no correlation, uh, like the mm -hmm. stars we discussed earlier, it, how, how strongly it correlates, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. Like a review of, OK, if I only look at one thing, what should I look at, for instance? Um, yeah, th this is quite quite new for us still. Um, so uh, we will definitely publish more blogs and like like data reviews and, anal uh, and analysis uh, around this project uh, to come. I'm working on like the research article right now. So, uh, But within the coming year, I'm hoping a lot of content around Around everything regarding open source and uh, its uh, and its uh, quality. How, have you ever? I, I don't know your background, so, so, so take the question the right way. But uh, have you ever compared the quality between closed source and, and open source? Do, do you have any sort of 
quantifiable metrics between those types of code bases? Um, no, and uh, we do get asked that question quite a lot, actually. Um, there is this thing called inner sourcing uh, that uh, very large companies usually do, where they publish uh, internal projects, uh, not open source, but uh, uh, open source within the organization so that uh, you don't build duplicate functionality uh, for, for your complete code base. Um, and of course, uh, like typically OSPOS and uh, uh, CTOs and development managers of a thousand developer plus organizations. Uh, when uh, when when we talk about the open source health model, they uh, we almost always get the question: Oh, I want to measure my own uh, inner sourcing projects, how they're doing, and uh, see if they're doing uh, doing well. Uh, and like the model doesn't really have that in mind. That's not the purpose. Uh, but uh, for instance, popularity is hard to measure because yeah. like we don't have the total amount of downloads from NPM, for instance, uh, because it's not published there. Uh, but the contributor score is uh, definitely uh, derivable from uh, even within inner source for uh, for the most part. Yeah, that's good. We, we've, <laughs> not, not to over promote, but we have another speaker about that as well on Frost North. So, so Isabel uh, Frost Drom. Uh, who's been, uh, or Drost from, I think, uh, German family names, sorry for butchering it, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> who, who will be talking about uh, the benefits of inner source and sort of how to employ the open source principles even internally, which I find interesting because I think that's, that's one of the steps you as an organization need to take to move towards being an open source organization further on along the road as well. Uh, this is, it has a lot of, to do with mindset uh, about control and ownership of the code and sharing. I yeah, definitely. I think that's uh, that's really good. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward to listen to that episode. Um, but one thing that's fun that we usually do uh, is that when we talk to larger customers, we analyze their open source projects that they have published, uh, <laughs> which is usually quite fun to do and sit there with a, with a product manager of the, or of the project or a CTO, like, okay, well, so here is the project health of, uh, of your the open source <laughs> you have published. Uh, it's usually yeah. like, and I'm got to say, I'm surprised that my, my initial thought was that, okay, a lot of companies, large companies publish open source projects uh, uh, with not the strongest quality always, uh, but uh, usually they managed to maintain it quite well, even though they were not had not gained a lot of popularity. Uh, they uh, still, in terms of how our model measure them, uh, managed to get quite high contributor scores still, which is uh, interesting. Well, I'm even curious, how did you get the idea for this? Uh, the, the company uh, obviously followed, it came from having an idea. So I'm interested in how you got the idea in the first place. Um, for the company or for like open for the idea or, or all of it? So uh, the company itself was founded from a research project uh, at Lund University. So was uh, we are four co-founders, so the three... Uh, the th three other co-founders were part of the research project and uh, where they looked at actually security uh, security vulnerabilities from dependencies within, especially within IoT devices. Um, and coming from that, uh, they realized that there was a gap in the market uh, around 2017, 18 uh, for a good product to, to do this. Um, but we quite uh, quite early on from founding the company, we realized that uh, we should broaden ourselves uh, not only from IoT but uh, to the uh, to the whole application layer, um, and that's where our journey began. Um, so from that research project, we've been working hard and failing a lot, honestly, uh, which is part of being a like tech venture capital startup uh, and like learning a lot. Uh, so, uh, and it, it's so much fun to to do the startup journey and I can recommend that to anyone. Cool. That sounds great. Uh, looking at the clock, we're, we're kind of reaching a point where we need to, to wrap up for today, but it, it was quite fun to, uh, to hear about the, the 
the huge database that makes me very interesting definitely mm -hmm. but, but also the the general approaches and uh, how how to approach uh, for instance license compliance from a static perspective and so on so mm -hmm. very fun having you on the pod so big thanks for for joining in I Thank suppose you, maybe we could we could do like a follow up someday on just drilling into one specific bit if if that would be if that would make sense. Yeah, once you've published your paper, we would love to have you again. Definitely, definitely. That good. sounds like a lot of fun. Or start <laughs> writing your books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which reminds me. <laughs> yeah. cool. Great. So thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Yeah, thank you for joining.